Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum. I'm Tom Schwartz, the director, and I'm pleased to open this important conference examining the many humanitarian efforts created in response to World War I. As many of you know, Herbert Hoover's moniker, the Great Humanitarian, had its origins in his efforts to help stranded Americans uh, safely return home at the outbreak of the war as well as his creation for the Commission for Relief in Belgium that provided food for millions of non-combatants in German-occupied Belgium and northern France. I hope you take time during your visit here today to explore the temporary exhibit, The Making of the Great Humanitarian, Herbert Hoover in World War I, as well as walk to the Belgian village just outside the museum to learn more about this significant historical event. I'd like to recognize the vital support for this program and all our programs by the Hoover Presidential Foundation. They make all of these conferences and temporary exhibits possible. If you are not a member, I hope you will pick up a membership brochure which is on the table just outside uh, the auditorium and consider adding your support. I also want to thank C-SPAN for being here today, making this conference available to a wider audience. And I would be remiss for not reminding everyone to silence all of your electronic devices now as a courtesy for the speakers and other members of the audience. At this time, I would like to introduce Matthew Schaefer, archivist at the Hoover Library and Museum. Matt is the organizer of this event, having assisted all the panelists in their various research projects that are reflected in today's conference. I'm constantly amazed at Matt's encyclopedic knowledge of the manuscript collections and his unfailing enthusiasm for assisting researchers in advancing our understanding of Herbert Hoover and his times. Here to introduce our speakers is Matt Schaefer. Thank you, Tom. It is my very great pleasure to introduce the speakers today uh, who will present. I've known them all for quite some time. Now, at my age, quite some time means some indefinite number of years between five and ten. I met each as they came to the Hoover Library uh, to do research on varied aspects of the Commission for Relief of Belgium. And now, uh, I, I am thrilled to introduce them and give them a chance to share what they've learned with you. I sometimes lead tours in the galleries here. I led one this morning. Uh, when I get to the World War, World War I era and talk about the CRB, I speak of Hoover feeding millions, Hoover organizing, Hoover, Hoover, Hoover. And perhaps understandably, it's the Hoover Presidential Library. But even as I'm giving this speech, I realize I'm doing a disservice to the hundreds of Americans and thousands of Europeans who form the, the boots on the ground, if you will, for the Commission of Relief of Belgium. These four folks have studied, it. each of those people have a story, thousands of stories. And these four have made a study of that, and they're going to share them with you today. Our first speaker, Brandon Little, came to Hoover as a topic while he was doing research on uh, naval history at Stanford. Uh, he was working the Tracy Kittredge files there, and he found an early history of the, of the CRB. This led, as for all good historians, to further research, further inquiry. And uh, he came out here a couple times on Hoover Foundation grants to do research. And he has written a book called Band of Crusaders. Brandon's book covers 50 years of humanitarian relief. Uh, it explains what I call the creation story of the CRB in the context of many competing agencies, uh, the difficulties of feeding people during World War I. And then he makes clear the special role, the pivotal role, played by the CRB in shaping later humanitarian efforts. Uh, I've added, thanks to Brandon, a new phrase when I do my tours. I speak of this band of crusaders. So that's, I think, a tribute. It's added a word to, words to my vocabulary. Well, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Tom, and thank you for having me here today. It's an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. Frankly, I think this is one of the best archival facilities in the entire world. And I've researched in many different places around the world. And I think it has no finer staff in their professionalism, their courtesy uh, and their interest in historical research. Uh, they're, they're unmatched, they're unparalleled. And so thank you 
for incubating and facilitating and making a historian's job, which can often be, well, treacherous and or at least full of drudgery uh, and <laughs> tedious, uh, making it a thorough and enjoyable process. So thank you. Uh, have you ever wondered when the idea emerged that in uh, the middle of a war or in the aftermath of a natural disaster that humanitarian aid would be forthcoming? That a flurry of organizations from around the world would rush to save lives? Well, we expect such things today, but this was not always so. So when did this humanitarian awakening begin? Well, over a decade ago, as Matt suggested, while I was a graduate student, I became interested in these questions in part by stumbling across humanitarian aid as an idea and as a, as a project and, as, uh, and, and looking specifically at, uh, at the way in which Americans got involved in feeding Belgium. It was a story I'd never heard before, and I was captivated then, and I remain captivated still. Now, the individuals featured here on this slide are some of those very same individuals who helped to feed a nation during a war, during an era prior to the internet, prior to the conveniences of cellular phones and a host of other technologies. And front and center, of course, is Herbert Hoover. I plan to tell a story now that reveals when the idea of saving lives amidst catastrophe emerged in full force. And I'll contend that a global humanitarian awakening occurred in the First World War, a century ago, uh, and its echoes still resonate today. Let us first consider some of the immediate catalysts for humanitarian intervention in the First World War, including some of the processes that awakened humanitarian sympathies. First, reflexively, communities across the globe offered aid to soldiers who they understood would be harmed by well, the violence of war. But communities across the world also offered aid to civilians and the reason being is that total war in the First World War engulfed entire societies. And so civilian populations became a source of humanitarian concern in ways that they hadn't perhaps been uh, as nearly prominent before. Now a second catalyst for humanitarian uh, intervention was the refugee, or the person of the refugee. And if you pay attention to news coming from Libya or Syria today, you know all about refugees. In the First World War, there were over 15 million people displaced from their homes. Now, of this vast flood, Americans constituted a minor stream. But that one stream proved extraordinarily powerful in awakening the United States government and American society to the reality of a world at war. In fact, the United States, in the very first weeks of the war, would dispatch a relief commission. And the warship here is the flagship of that, the USS Tennessee. And it was sent to help facilitate the exodus of 125,000 Americans who had been stranded in Europe at war's outbreak. The dramatic departure of this ship and the nature of Americans being stranded in Europe awakened American society to the reality of not only this refugee crisis, but the broader humanitarian dimensions of this enlarging conflict. It was hard not to pay attention to the refugee crisis in the United States. Uh, that was predominantly an immigrant nation, much more so then than perhaps today. A third catalyst in the awakening of humanitarian interest and intervention was the imminent starvation of a nation trapped between the warring coalitions. And this is a story that features Herbert Hoover's unlikely entrance to the world of humanitarian relief by his acceptance of Belgian entreaties to organize an international food relief program for the, the more than 9 million Belgians and, and French people living in German-occupied territory, and he did so in 1914. This program was called, of course, the Commission for Relief in Belgium, the CRB, and the focus of my colleagues' presentations today. The central point I'd like to make about this remarkable organization is that its successful nation-feeding operations encouraged imitators. In 1915, for example, the Rockefeller Foundation, then a pioneering giant in the field of philanthropy and public health, seriously considered forming a commission for relief in Poland based on the model that Hoover had forged in Belgium. 
And then the far right here, you can see members of that Rockefeller Foundation uh, engaging with German officials as they negotiated the formation or the attempted formation of a CRP for Poland. And of course, Hoover on the left, and then below is a map that indicates sort of the global flows of food in, into ultimately Belgium uh, under the auspices of the CRB. Now, the CRB also emboldened war-weary populations and their loved ones in the United States to solicit American aid. It awakened the idea around the world that America was a font of generosity. And people became habituated to starting to ask Americans for aid as a result of what Hoover was demonstrating in Belgium. Now, in truth, feeding Belgium was extraordinarily complicated and improbable. Its success was unlikely, given the extraordinary challenges the war continued to present. But nevertheless, Hoover and his associates figured out a way to make it work. And because it was so successful, people understood that it was at least possible you could aid populations during a war. Not just after, but during a war. And because they demonstrated it was possible, people started to expect that it, it should be doable and it should be forthcoming not just could, but should be forthcoming. And this guiding principle of relief in the midst of calamity was forever entrenched in international opinion. And we live in a world that has been shaped powerfully by that expectation. Belgian relief also shaped and influenced U.S. war policy by positioning Americans as defenders of embattled civilian populations. This theme of intercession on behalf of victims of war and victims of aggression resonated in President Woodrow Wilson's war message to Congress in 1917, in which he proclaimed the need to make the world safe for democracy and to protect the rights of small nations, which you could translate simply as stopping aggressors and helping the vulnerable. These are noble goals indeed. And here on the left, we can see a poster. This is a U.S. Liberty Loan poster that came about after the United States declared war on Germany. And it invokes the concept of remembering German atrocities in Belgium, a story with which all Americans had become familiar. And it depicts basically the flames of a Belgian city and a German soldier carrying off a young Belgian girl to do dastardly crimes. This notion of wartime remembrance was a powerful mobilizing tool for Americans who were accustomed to remember such things as remember the Alamo, remember the Maine, remember Belgium, and fight to liberate Belgians who are under the, the steel-toed boots of German oppression. On the far right, we see actually a U.S. Food Administration poster. Now, the Food Administration was actually formed during, the, during wartime uh, by Herbert Hoover and his associates. Many of the CRB personnel ended up helping to populate and organize the Food Administration that managed national food production and consumption in a way that could satisfy the voracious appetites of Allied forces, as well as the beleaguered peoples who Americans had been feeding for a number of years already. And that's the message of the poster here. Hunger. For three years, America has fought starvation in Belgium. Will you eat less food? in essence, to help continue to provide the enlarging demands of the Allied war machine. You've already been doing it, just keep doing it more of it. Now the end of the war, well actually I'll back up for just a moment. I said policemen and firemen of the world, what do I mean by that? Well, just recently Teddy Roosevelt, when he was president, had advanced a concept of Americans becoming a world police force. In effect, arguing that Americans should intervene wherever there's unrest around the world for the sake of instilling uh, stability and peace. Guess what? During World War I, we can amplify this concept because of the humanitarian urgency of so many distressed peoples. I would argue that the American population embraces the idea that they become the firemen of the world too, to extinguish the flames of war and revolution and the unrest that they create. Now, the end of the war, which was signaled by an armistice in 1918, did not do much to stop the misery war had produced. And no better illustration of the enduring humanitarian catastrophe can be found than in the necessity to forge an even larger humanitarian organization 
to feed even more distressed peoples in the aftermath of the war. And this was called the American Relief Administration, or the ARA. Now, the ARA was a bit like the CRB, but on steroids. Uh, it was bigger and more powerful, and it was a hybrid U.S. governmental, military, and private organization that fed tens of millions tens of millions of malnourished people in more than 20 war-devastated countries between 1919 and 1924. And the map and the poster in the foreground feature ARA food distribution channels in Soviet Russia in the early 1920s. Unsurprisingly, Hoover and his associates from the CRB formed the leadership of these organizations, the U.S. Food Administration and the American Relief Administration, because they already developed the expertise there are other organizations that try to replicate what Hoover and his associates were doing. One of these is the International Committee of the Red Cross in operations in post-war Greece. And it failed miserably in its efforts to replicate what Hoover had done. They just couldn't match it. Nobody had figured out to, the way to crack the Hoover formula, or at least to follow that recipe. One of the essential links to what I call the ongoing revolution in, military, or in humanitarian affairs is the way in which emergency relief in the form of food and medical distribution, necessitated larger economic reconstruction initiatives simply to deliver supplies or emergency supplies en masse. Today we call this nation building. Across the continent of Europe, the ARA rebuilt or improved national railway, seaport, and telecommunication systems to facilitate the distribution of emergency supplies in tremendous quantities. So combating famine required really two things. One, an organization that could actually perform the work. And second, it required developing an infrastructure and revitalizing an economic infrastructure that would permit the distribution of relief supplies. Which meant that American relief administrators worked so closely and were so enmeshed in European economics and politics that they understandably chafed local sensibilities wherever they worked even though they were working to save people's lives. From the standpoint of American aid organizers, their efforts to safeguard lives endangered by war would be wasted, absolutely wasted, if stable foundations for peace were not ensured, in effect by laying the groundwork for stable political and economic development that diminished the likelihood of a recurrence of war. So remaking European society thoroughly infused all American humanitarian imperatives in this conflict. We could ask, well, what, what's the takeaway from the perspective of Americans who do this relief work overseas mostly, or facilitate it by supporting it in the United States? Certainly, some ambulance drivers, such as liter the literary giants uh, Ernest Hemingway or John Dos Passos, saw their fill of carnage and wrote stories about the futility of war that created lingering impressions that Americans simply wanted to distance themselves from a perpetually war-wracked European society. But in stark contrast, Hoover's veterans, or veterans of Hoover's organizations, did not feel their work was in vain. And photographs such as this of Belgian children eating food and smiling in, with the stars and stripes nonetheless confirmed for Americans the value of ingratiating foreign populations and developing and cultivating a love for America, thanks due to American generosity. Now, the memoirs of American humanitarians associated with Hoover, their letters to family and friends, their correspondence, their diaries, their even their obituaries, testify to their firm conviction that, they're in, that the most meaningful work they ever did, and some of these become senior American officials, most meaningful work they ever did was saving the lives of children like this. And we can find that type of evidence actually here at the Hoover Presidential Library in its collections. Now Hoover's deputies, perhaps disciples would be a better word, uh, in the CRB and like organizations forged a lifelong fraternity. They maintained alumni networks and kept in constant contact. Something I'll pick up and draw on a little bit later in my presentation also. Now, Hoover called these individuals who worked with him a band of crusaders. They called him their chief, and they remained devoutly loyal to him for the rest of their lives. The Great Depression 
and its harmful effects on Hoover's reputation did little to dampen their enthusiasm for his leadership. Rarely do historians or readers of history consider Hoover a particularly charismatic individual, but his crusaders felt differently. They truly did. Now, there was one observer of Hoover in this era who recognized this contrast between two divergent views of Hoover. And his name was Joseph Willard. He was the American ambassador to Spain during the First World War. And in his post-war diary, Ambassador Willard described Hoover as possessing, and I quote, no personal magnetism. <laughs> but, Willard acknowledged, everyone who has ever worked for Hoover has become devoted admirers. Not only did Hoover's crusaders magnetically attract and attach themselves to their chief and remain devotees of his humanitarian statesmanship for the rest of their lives, but several of them became central figures in some of the world's leading humanitarian agencies later in their lives. The Hooverians, as I call them, the Hoovermen, um, were not the only individuals involved in international aid projects. They weren't. But what distinguishes them from the constantly shifting leadership of so many other relief societies is that the Hooverians constituted a united front. Irrespective of US governmental, international, or private relief activities with which they were associated, well into the middle 20th century, the Hooverians acted in concert to advance a common agenda in accordance with their chief's vision and principles relating to international security. And actually here on the far right, we see an ARA Association annual dinner from when? March 1941, not far before uh, the United States would formally enter World War II. So these are individuals decades later still getting together on an annual basis to maintain the relationships they had forged in a previous war. Imagine that they will join together again when a second world war breaks out. Geopolitically, Hoover's band and many senior officials in the United States government ever since, whether they acknowledge it or not, ascribe to what I call the contagion theory of international relations. And the line of reasoning of this contagion theory, as I would frame it, goes something like this. War, revolution, natural disaster, governmental misrule produces great distress. And that distress breeds radicalism, leads to unrest, and potentially violence. And consequently, Hoover was deeply concerned that World War I and other chronic problems overseas would produce radicalism, produce violence, produce instability, and perhaps even encourage populations that are beleaguered by famine and other difficulties to embrace political pathologies like communism. And he was not alone. President Woodrow Wilson, channeling Hoover, uh, would state, hunger does not breed reform, it breeds madness. And therein lies that kernel of the idea of the contagion, that in order to arrest the spread of disaster, American aid needed to be injected. If we were to use a medical metaphor, an injection, an inoculation so that, to cure uh, these ailments. And in the short term, it might hurt, but in the long term, uh, you'd receive greater protection. Now, the essence of Hoover's thinking in World War I, and actually in World War II, in, a, in essence, was this. If you give a man bread, he won't turn red. <laughs> now, it didn't turn out so well in Soviet Russia, uh, for Hoover, at least, in the 1920s. But his confidence in this formula of American aid provides a baseline of stability so that prosperity can be achieved. That formula, he remained unflinchingly convinced of for the rest of his life, and his disciples did too. Now, these ideas formed in World War I, and they uh, picked up again in World War II, particularly when Hitler's armies went on the rampage. And as soon as war broke out, the Second World War, Hoover's network reconstituted itself. They formed a second commission for relief in Belgium. They formed now a commission for relief in Poland, they formed a Finnish relief fund. They formed, as the letterhead here says on the bottom, a national committee on food for the small democracies, which are now, well, occupied by Hitler's armies. So they reconstituted their organizations, or at least tried to, but discovered some impediments. And that was ultimately the opposition of President Roosevelt and the opposition of Prime Minister Churchill to permitting aid on a scale in a similar fashion to the kind that was offered in Belgium in World War I. They, they, 
Hoover, uh, I'm sorry, Roosevelt and Churchill just simply blocked it. These organizations, though, in their infancy or their renewed infancy, were, in the words of one Hooverian named Morris Pate, uh, quote, dotted with former CRB and ARA men. Surprise, surprise. The individuals who wanted to reconstitute their former organizations and help the very same people they had helped before. But daunted in that inability to reconstitute large aid organizations, most of the Hooverians found their way into meaningful work in World War II. One directed the American Red Cross Prisoner of War Care Package Program. Another directed U.S. policy, U.S. government policy with respect to war charities. A third, or several of them actually, managed and designed military government curriculum programs to train U.S. officers how to manage conquered territories and liberated territories. Where did they gain this expertise and the credibility? From their experiences in World War I. During the Second World War, Hoover and his deputies labored to awaken American society to an impending disaster at war's end. They certainly did. They expected that malnutrition would be raging across the world, that famine would spread, that diseases would spread, uh, that communism would spread, and they wanted to uh, avert all of those disasters by laying effective foundations for a durable post-war peace. But honestly, few Americans, at least in the, in the war years themselves, or in the immediate aftermath of the war, listened to them. Revenge was, a, was an animating impulse, or the desires for revenge. Few people wanted to consider the, the possibility of treating the Germans, or especially the Japanese, in a nice way at war's end. But by 1947, something dramatic had happened. The occupied peoples of the Axis countries, in Germany and Japan, were in such desperation that they grew uh, weary, and they grew angry, and American occupation generals understood this and sent war warnings to Washington, D.C., and said, please send food, because otherwise you need to send troops to maintain security in our occupied zones. Americans had a lot of food. They didn't have that many troops as America's armies were demobilizing. Hoover also warned about post-war famine conditions endangering the lives of one-third the world's population. One third of the world, Hoover claimed, were at risk of starvation. And this wasn't just his own, uh, own idea. He had actually traveled with President Truman's endorsement on a global, series of global missions to evaluate world food conditions and economic conditions, and basically to formulate recommendations that are merged into what comes to be called more popularly the Marshall Plan. Critically, uh, we can see here one of the reports that Hoover would pen President's economic mission to Germany and Austria. In that sense, the president is also former President Hoover, and he's writing it for President Truman, resident president. But you know, here he is traipsing through the ruins of a German city. Collectively, though, Hoover's warnings helped to create a crisis mentality in Washington that triggered a response. And ultimately, Congress and, and the agencies of the government would, would work to create this Marshall Plan. But we overlook something essential with this vital program called the Marshall Plan, and that is it requires uh, well-fed populations to do reconstruction work. Hoover understood this first and foremost. If there's not food, the people will not have the strength to rebuild anything. We could ask, ultimately, uh, who are the people who did this work? Who are the Hooverians? Let's highlight a few biographies of some essential figures in the U.S. government and related agencies during the Second World War and beyond. On the upper right here, we have a fellow named Maurice Pate, uh, seen younger years and a, a bit older, but he started in the CRB. He worked in Poland with the ARA. In the Second World War, he works in at least a variety of organizations in conjunction with his chief, who is Hoover. He doesn't find a ready job in those, or an enduring one, so he directs the American Red Cross Prisoner of War Care Package System, shipping food all over the world. He'd already learned how to do it. After the war, and as a result of his wartime experiences, he would become the executive director for a new international organization called UNICEF, his child feeding organization. He remains in that position for 18 years until he dies in 1965, one year after his chief, Herbert Hoover. But everything he ever did in his life, he credited to Hoover. Hallam Tuck, seen in his younger years on the bottom left and in the middle, standing beside Hoover, would also start in the CRB. In World War II, he did the same types of things that Pate did, although he works in military government programs in the U.S. Navy and Army. Afterwards, he becomes an international refugee expert. 
and he directs a new organization called the International Refugee Organization, establishes it to settle all these displaced peoples across Europe during World War II, and he steps out of that job, and those jobs then become called the UN High Commission for Refugees and the UN Relief and Works Agency, both of which are alive and well today. Arthur Ringland in the far in the bottom right uh, started a little later working for Hoover under the American Relief Administration. During the Second World War, he managed the U.S. policy from the State Department, but he managed U.S. policy with respect to war charities, worked to centralize them, make them more efficient. And from that position, he would be the founding father of a new organization called CARE, established in 1945 to do what? Send care packages overseas, which is where we get the term. We often think of it, but don't realize the connection. Where does he get the idea for CARE about shipping aid packages overseas? Well, it's from the ARA. And the ARA provided the explicit model for care officials to send emergency food packages globally in the aftermath of the war and to avert disaster. These are, in, in essence, private initiatives or international initiatives, but supported fully by their friends in Congress. On the bottom left, there's a fellow named Christian Herter uh, in his younger years, and on the far right, a fellow named Alex Smith in his older years. But collectively, two leading legislators in, from New Jersey and Massachusetts would help to funnel and finance American dollars and policy support for Hooverian initiatives after World War II. Who funds UNICEF? Well, the U.S. government does initially. Why? In part because individuals like Herter and Smith understand this holistic need to encourage prosperity and peace <coughs> through food security. And so American legislation, such as the Mutual Security Assistance Act and others that send tanks overseas to allies, also funds UNICEF to send milk overseas to children. And the reason being is evidenced by letters like this one in the middle from Kate as director of UNICEF to his friend Alex in the U.S. Senate is basically to confirm the wisdom of continuing to send U.S. dollars to his friend's programs. It's not just because they're friends, it's the they agree upon the work. These guys helped to shape, ultimately, U.S. policy in the Cold War to encourage American money for development programs, to encourage American initiatives in the developing world, as well as even to encourage American military intervention in certain countries, also to inject a measure of stability a la Teddy Roosevelt. So what does that leave us with? Well, ultimately, we should consider that in the First World War, all of this relief stuff is ad hoc, impermanent. Nobody expects to need to do it again. They don't want to do it again. But when World War II rolls around and the Cold War persists this strategic stalemate, or, or uh, keeps it going, um, the Hooverians decide to institutionalize these entities internationally as well as within the auspices of the U.S. government. And you can take a selection from just about any president ever since and look at some key themes, and basically they all emphasize, whether Truman or Kennedy or Obama today, uh, that Americans play a special intercessory role in the world. They are concerned about rebuilding from disasters, man-made and otherwise. They are concerned about preventing future ones through democratization initiatives, strategically invoked uh, foreign aid programs, selected military intervention, and a diverse array of humanitarian activity. So we could call this perhaps uh, the ongoing uh, revolution in humanitarian affairs. Thank you.